Canelli from the League of Women Voters. We've been doing series now, I think this is our third series of programming. Um, and this series is called Constitutional Crises? Question mark. Um, so I'd like to invite Kate Rader to come up here and to talk a little bit about the League and also to introduce tonight's speaker. Please help me welcome Kate Rader. <laughs> Thank you for coming. The League's mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. We hope that our collaboration with the Colorado Hubbard Library advances that mission. Our next program on May 15th is on the impact of single issue politics by both organizations and individuals. I hope you'll be here in Maine. Tonight, we explore liberalism and conservatism and how the meaning of those words have changed over the years. To lead this discussion, I'm introducing Professor Anthony Jack Brzezinski, <coughs> Chair of the UVM Department of Political Science and Director of the Vermont Legislative Research Service. Jack. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, what I have planned for tonight is I wanted to go over a handful of things about ideology in the U.S. from the perspective of political scientists, particularly those who study public opinion. Um, and then my, and my preferred mode of these sort of talks is to have more of a conversation. And so I want to sort of set the stage and see where you as, a, as, a, as the, the audience would like to take uh, the discussion. So first starting off, uh, some sort of background, general context on ideology and how we study it in, in political science. Uh, the use of liberalism and conservatism, uh, it has a number of different problems with it in terms of the labels or categorizing people in terms of politics. Uh, but nonetheless, political scientists and others who study this and definitely as part of our political discourse in our culture, uh, we use these labels quite a bit. So first off, I want to show you a distribution of where people are on the ideological spectrum in the United States. Uh, what we do, the American National Election Studies, which is an organization from my discipline that uh, uh, surveys the public every two to four years during election years to try to understand what the public's thinking about politics and try to explain their participation, their behavior, uh, their thoughts about politics. Anyway, every a couple of years, the American National Election Studies ask questions where they basically give people a seven point scale ranging from extremely conservative to extremely liberal and ask uh, people to put themselves on that scale. Uh, and what you find if you do that, that's kind of, the print's pretty small. I'll have to explain. The extremely liberals on the left, I color coded it based on current coding for liberal and conservative. And extremely conservative on the right, with the purple in the middle being people who place themselves in the middle or consider themselves moderate. Uh, one of the main points, and you know, when living in Vermont, we don't really get this most of the time, but the rest of the country is pretty conservative. And so you see that the scale tilting towards the conservative side after you move away from those who are moderates. This distribution has been stable for decades. Uh, with little bits of fluctuation, I, didn't, I just wanted to throw this up to show that there aren't any overall big trends that are going on as far as ideology. Pretty much uh, the, the way people uh, end up categorizing themselves has been consistent over a long period of time. Uh, and by the way, I can email this to you, uh, or uh, and if any of you want to have access to this oh, to look at the data more sure. closely, I'm more than happy to share that. Uh, so, as far as ideology is concerned, from a political perspective, uh, I don't know why it's sort of cut off at the end. Hopefully, that's not going to be too much of a problem. Uh, we define our ideology in a pretty, pretty simple way. Political ideology is a consistent set of values and beliefs throughout the proper purpose and scope of government. So what you want governments to do and how much of it you want governments to do. Uh, the meaning of liberal and conservative, which is common, commonly used in our political discourse, you can ask people about to define these terms. 
And basically what we found as political scientists is that for a long time, people aren't really clear on what liberal and conservative mean. Uh, and so they'll reference either dictionary definitions, you know, liberal person is a generous person, or they'll use terms such as liberals are for big government and conservatives are for small government. The problem with that is that it's not always true. Uh, and that if you take certain functions that governments <laughs> perform, the conservatives are often from time to time in favor of larger government, in particular for uh, policies that maintain order in society, therefore spending more on the military, and for maintaining order in the sense of uh, traditional ways of behavior in society that they feel need to be enforced to do things like regulate pornography or, or ban access to abortion, things along those lines. The conservatives are for a big government, government involvement in those areas. And liberals on the flip side are not always for big government because of just taking the opposite of that. So there's a problem in using this notion of liberal conservative. And so some political scientists have argued that a better way of understanding where people fall ideologically is to go take a step back and look at people's core values. And the argument is that uh, in a political system, there are a set of values that people hold that conflict from time to time. And that we can understand people's overall ideology if we understand which of the values they tend to put a priority on over other values. So, uh, the main values that conflict, freedom and order, and freedom and equality. Uh, and so if you think about it, uh, freedom, just lack of any uh, constraints on your behavior. Order is maintaining uh, law and order, but as I said, also maintaining your no sort of social order. Uh, in Vermont, we have issues with you know, swimming holes and whether you can go swimming without any clothes on, things along those lines. Uh, some towns don't like that. They ban that. That's a form of social order saying that's not appropriate behavior for people. Equality is the third value that's key in terms of a democracy. And that's whether the government's going to be involved in trying to promote greater equality, whether it be political equality or social equality. And social equality includes economic equality. And to a certain extent, everybody in our democracy holds these values as important. But the problem is that when you're promoting government policy, these values often come in conflict. So as you promote more order in society, you limit people's freedom uh, to go through, you know, get on the airplane without having to take off their shoes, for example, as opposed to the government concerned about uh, terrorist attacks. And so they want to make sure they protect our life and, and uh, from, from those sort of attacks. And so we give up some of our freedom in that sense uh, for that order. Or uh, after September 11th, there's a great expansion on the part of the government's uh, attempt to maintain order. Uh, so the government, uh, you know, we had the USA Patriot Act, uh, and that meant the government was uh, getting involved in uh, following us or violating our privacy. People didn't have the freedom to do the things they wanted to do without government uh, surveillance sort of thing. And we gave up some of that in terms of public because we wanted to restore that sense of order, that sense of safety. Uh, equality and freedom are the other two values that clash. Uh, uh, if we want to create greater equality in our society, economic equality, uh, we have to take uh, the earnings of some and redistribute those to others through things such as a progressive tax or through social programs. Uh, and so the idea that that notion of liberal conservative or simple left right doesn't work too well, uh, political scientists who argue that we need to look at these core values of ideology argue that instead of thinking of a simple dimension of ideology, we should really think about it as two dimensions of ideology. Uh, that are formed by the trade-off in these values. And that if you look at, if you place people in terms of where they land on their preference of order versus freedom and equality versus freedom, you actually come up with four different ideologies. Uh, so the true small government people are the libertarians who really want free. They don't want government involved in promoting a lot of order, and they don't want government involved in promoting a lot of 
uh, freedom or e e equality as well. Communitarians, label for the people, it, it actually uh, fit well for populists down in the South uh, when the Democratic Party still had some strength in the South. Uh, that was because they emphasized uh, equality over freedom, uh, and didn't, and, but Democrats in the South were also those who were more in favor of order, however. Right? So those are the true big government people, if you will. Liberals and conservatives, as we understand them, fit in those other two quadrants. In understanding this, you can see why, if you're, if you, the why people end up not fitting into each of the categories of liberal conservatives so well. It may be that some people really are more libertarian uh, than they are liberal or than they are conservative. So just, I, I wanted to lay this groundwork as we move on with our conversation uh, as a different way to conceive or think about ideology. So two-dimensional notion of ideology uh, really doesn't function that well, but bottom line in our culture and in the research, there's still a lot of reliance on that notion of liberalism versus conservatism. <coughs> and it's interesting, you know, just one little side, for example, how you might, if you, you back up and think about liberals, libertarians, conservatives, and communitarians, uh, there's long been a charge by the conservatives that the mainstream media has a liberal bias. And as you've all heard, uh, they won't let us or let the culture forget that claim. But if you actually look at journalists, they always point at journalists and say, look, journalists are liberal, therefore the media is liberal. But if you actually look more closely at journalists, they're more libertarian than they are liberal. They're not liberal on economic issues. They're liberal on social issues. And the economic versus social issues is a shorthand for saying they're liberal when it comes to uh, the freedom versus order trade-off but they're not so liberal when it comes to the freedom versus equality tree. Does that make sense? All right. So, um, so despite those shortcomings, you know, we still talk about liberal versus conservative, most common way, and I'm going to give you some information and data on liberal versus conservative in the U.S., but keep in mind that notion that, um, that these categories don't work that well. All right. So, the main thing in terms of ideology in the U.S. Uh, that I'm thinking you might want to discuss is the notion of polarization. And so polarization is, as you probably all know, I'm sure you've talked about it, uh, that notion where people on either side of the ideological spectrum or the partisan spectrum uh, seem so far apart and get so angry and can't even have uh, arguments about anything or discussion about anything because they're so polarized, they're so far apart on the ideological spectrum. To understand polarization and what is known as partisan sorting, I have to give you a definition of partisanship. Because ideology and partisanship are not the same thing. Ideology is that, you know, I repeat the definition of that, it's a set of values and beliefs about what government should be doing and how much of it it should be doing. A set of values, political values. Partisanship is, uh, the way we study it uh, in my discipline of political science is more about your affinity or affiliation with one of the major parties, or not. And so we've measured uh, partisanship for a long time now in the US, uh, political scientists have, with a question, generally speaking, do you consider yourself a Democrat, a Republican, or an Independent? And then there's a follow-up question. If people say uh, they're a Republican, you ask, are you a strong Republican or not so strong Republican? If they say independent, then you ask, do you find yourself leaning more towards the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? And we come up with a seven-point scale, seven-point scales, being of the nine, I guess, uh, of partisanship. And this is what uh, partisanship, the distribution of uh, the electorate, looked like from the 2016 uh, American National Election Studies survey, uh, you actually find more people identifying as Democrats than Republicans. When was that survey? 2016. And it's pretty, the Democrats have long had an edge in terms of party identification. 
the one thing about the way we as political scientists measure this is that uh, sometimes in media polls, they really don't ask people a follow-up question about being independent. And it turns out that people who are independent but lean towards one party act just like regular partisans. They just don't like the label, the party label. And it's the independents who are actually, the independents are the ones who are the least informed, the least interested, the least involved, and the least likely to vote. They're actually the worst citizens in the <laughs> democracy, the pure independents. Do they lean more to the Democratic or to the Republican Party, as per your question? What? Uh, you said before that uh, there was a question uh, as to, to independence, whether they leaned more to de the Democratic or the Republican. Do you know the results? Yeah, they're right here. On either side of that independent. So that separates out those who lean one way or the other. So 11% of the public are independents who lean towards the Republican at the Democratic Party, and 11% independents who lean towards the Republican Party. So you can't really be a strong independent? Well, you can. These are general, you know, these are in the social sciences, which we're, we're describing the pa general patterns. So there can always be an outlier, but uh, in terms of strong independent. You're, in, you're, an you're an indecisive individual if you're an independent? Or you well, if you go back to the, yeah, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> um, because if you, once I map out the rest of this, it's kind of clear that if you're a pure independent uh, and you hold any political values, it's it's hard to see given how divided we are. So you might not be independent. Uh, uh, independent. You might not be leaning toward one of the other friends of the political party. Yeah. That you're, you're then you're, you can be pretty. Uh, uh, strong about your belief in an individual. Yeah, if you have a mix of beliefs that cross both parties, and going back to that ideology, there is, it's possible that you could be, say, a libertarian, uh, and you support the Republicans on some views and the Democrats on other views. So you can be an informed, indep pure independent that way. But what you found is most pure independents are not informed at all. Because once you find out what's going on, it's hard not to end up taking a side. All right, any other questions? So, uh, that gives you the definition of partisanship, gives you distribution, we went over ideology. What are the big trends right now in terms of our culture, and this is not gonna be a big surprise to you, but I'll show you some data on that, is how uh, we, it used to be that ideologies were a little more mixed among the parties, uh, you know, when, I first moved into Vermont in 1992. The state hadn't voted for a Democratic candidate for president in many, many decades. I think it was going back to Johnson, if I recall correctly. Uh, and it was, you know, in the Northeast was, you know, a Republican territory. Uh, what has happened over time is that, as is that, uh, what's known as partisan sorting has taken place in that the ideologies have sorted themselves out into the Democratic or Republican Party, so that where we had more of a mix of ideology in both parties, we now have a Democratic Party that is very liberal, and mostly liberal, and a Republican Party that is very conservative. And the data I have for that comes from the Pew Research Center, uh, and this shows you over time, I'll have to walk through it, but again, if you want to get this PowerPoint slide, it has the data and the sources you could look out for this information. It starts in 1994, ends in 2014, and basically what this does is it maps out, uh, it asks a series of questions of the public on policy matters and political values uh, that were, if you came down on one side, you were conservative, if you came down on the other side, you were liberal, so this gets to that sort of mix of where people might stand on that. Uh, and it then charted, all right, where's the median Democrat in 2000, in 1994, and where do the Republicans, uh, people who identify as Republicans, land on that scale based on those 10 questions that measure ideology? And so back in 1994, you had 64% of Republicans uh, were um, more conservative than the median Democrat, and 70% of Democrats were more liberal than the median Republican. 
So you see, and you can see by the tails here, that there is a bit of overlap between people who identify with the two parties. You see the general change over time until you get to 2014, and you have 92% of Republicans are more conservative than the median Democrat, and 94% of Democrats are more liberal than the median Republican. So what has happened over time is there's been a great deal of sorting, whereas in the past, 30, 40, 50 years, even further back, uh, the parties weren't so clearly ideologically defined in terms of the people who identify with the parties, it, they are now. So we've had a great deal of sorting so that the liberals have gone over to the Democratic side and the uh, Republicans over, and the conservatives over the Republican side. The other thing about the other trend as far as partisanship and ideology are concerned is that along with this change, this partisan shorted, sorting, we've had a rise in the level of feelings, the amount of the level of affect people have about the political parties. So that uh, we have an increase over time in unfavorable ratings of the party, the other party that you don't identify with. Uh, so back in 1994, 16% of Democrats had an unfa very unfavorable view of the Republican Party. And only 17% of Republicans had a very unfavorable view of the Democratic Party. You can see the bars go up 2004, 2014, and they added on an additional question asking uh, respondents uh, whether they saw the other party as a threat to the nation's well-being. And you can see in terms of polarization, there's been a, a big increase, uh, or that there's a significant amount of this negative affect that, that is associated with actually thinking the other party is a threat to the well-being of the nation. And I'm sure you've all paid attention to the rhetoric and the discourse and politics and the news, and that should be no surprise to you. So we have this part, this this ideological sorting, so that the parties have become more uh, similar along the lines of their ideology. Democrats becoming more liberal, Republicans becoming more conservative, and people really uh, the level of emotion that's associated with their political views of partisanship and ideology have really gone up significantly, and there's a lot of disdain or contempt for members of the other party. So, I have some, this is where I like to stop, and this is what I do with my students as well. What explains this? I have my next slide where I have ideas I can throw out. But I thought it might be better that if we had a conversation about, if first of all, if there are any questions about what I presented, but also we can move on and say, okay, this is, you know, I, we know this polarization is going on. Here's the evidence to really suggest that it's much worse than it used to be in the past. How do we explain this? How do we explain the nature of our political culture? I, I sort of have a uh, prior question. Okay. And, and uh, is there any um, way of measuring cycles in history of this country where things have been more polarized and less polarized? And, and is that information that you rely on to, or can rely on? Yes. Uh, we, uh, whole public opinion polling only came around in, in the 1950s. So we don't have anything that goes back further in terms of assessing polarization. But we know from the start of that time that uh, that polarization was not there. And you can extrapolate by looking at elections, election returns of people who are elected from different areas. Uh, the South was solidly democratic uh, for a long time, and their, you know, the ideology there was more uh, conservative or communitarian, if you would. Um, but it was, you know, and driven by racism, basically, uh, to maintain power in the South. Uh, and because of that mix, and they were part of the National Democratic Party, you know that the ideological distribution within the party was was quite the mix back then. And you can look at the appeal of candidates from New England going back who were Republicans and look at their, their policy stances and their success. So you don't have to rely just on public opinion polls uh, to say that, look, we are more divided than we have been since the Civil War, and political scientists will put it in those terms. Right, I mean, right where the Civil War is a benchmark for division in the country, but also <coughs> during 
Jackson's administration that you know, it, it, you know, there was heavy polarization at that time as well. I, it just seems like there's a cycle that runs through uh, our lives. Yeah, do you think this is just part of the normal cycle, or do you think no, so? No, I think the media drives, uh, 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 drives this, uh, this polarization in, in conscious and unconscious ways. Right? <coughs> you know, you look at the rise of uh, you know, Fox News, it's the relationship with the White House is a very different uh, basket of eggs than ever before, uh, it seems to me. Has anyone studied with all these cycles, how long they take? And there is a theory about partisan realignment that is tied into some of these cycles. Uh, but you know, if you're going back to the Civil War, this is an awful long time to actually say anything is really a cycle at this point. Yeah. And I do think there are more things going on here. And you started on the media issue, and I'd like to run with that a little bit in the back side. Um, yeah, um, so I wanted to like uh, just piggyback on what he said. Um, I think John Stewart called it out well when he went on Tucker Carlson's sh show on Crossfire on CNN. And I showed that to my media class. Oh, yeah, okay. I just thought that's so perfect, because it's not just Fox News. It's like they set up this whole like either or. You're, this or that, and I remember him just going out saying, stop hurting America, please stop, and begging them, and Tucker lost the show after that, but anyway, so it's, yeah, it definitely, and it's hyper, I think at this point, with all the fake news on Facebook, that's really gotten us into a really bad uh, hole, and they did studies and found that it was mostly elderly people and conservatives that were almost always, uh, the huge amount of fake news was spread by those people, so it was kind of, not to be partisan. <laughs> That's just what the study showed. So. It's a it's a great little piece if you want to do a Google search and look up the YouTube video of John Stewart appeared on yeah. CNN Crossfire and they canceled it a week later. And John Stewart provided this wonderful critique of the way the media is just providing theater for us and it just carries the talking points of either side. And he called them both political hacks. And it's interesting. They didn't really get in a lot of the people. And you could tell they didn't get it. They didn't understand what he was trying to get at. Uh, since then, I've seen that you know quotes from that appear in books on the media, and you know I opened my class in politics in the media with that video up until this year. It's for sure. I thought it was getting too old because it was 2004. But the media has a central role here, but in a lot of different ways. Right? So you mentioned social media, uh, there and and Fox. You know, we have these partisan news outlets, and we have talk radio. Uh, the liberals tend to follow, you know, the, the, the Daily Show or, or the satire shows instead. Uh, we have changes in our media environment that we haven't really ever seen. And one of the things about politics, people often say, well, you know, candidates were always going negative against other candidates. Yes, but they didn't have the megaphone and the distribution and the ability to go viral that they do today. So if I can just step back on the Fox, we'll pick on that one first. Um, one of the changes that happened during the 1980s of the Reagan administration, you know, going back to that conservative, you want less government, so there's deregulation on the media, and they eliminated the Fairness Doctrine. I don't know if you guys know what the Fairness Doctrine was, but it required if you if it was a gave time to one political point of view, you had to give equal time to the other side. You get rid of that, and, uh, and, and media organizations can go, well, we can just go all one side. And so you have the rise of talk radio after that, and then media outlets like Fox News, and now on the left you have the response with MSNBC. Uh, so that sort of deregulation of the media really opened up to partisan, opened up the, the, the um, broadcast media to, to more partisan media, and that provided more cho choice for people, uh, and so individuals started to sort themselves out in terms of which media they would pay attention to and allowed for the creation of echo chambers where you only hear those things that support your views. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have a kind of technical question. Okay. If the fairness rule is reinstated, that would not, that would only apply to broadcast, right? Over yes. the air, airwaves. So, 
now that everything is cable and internet, even if you somehow could get that through Congress, it probably would have very little effect except maybe even diminish further. Or no, yeah, that, that, the, the horse has left that barn. It's never going to go back. Um, and especially, you know, but it, it came at a time, uh, uh, as far as the media is concerned, where it really opened the door uh, and, and got the ball rolling in terms of this polarization or this party. So my own um, point was that somehow you can't fix this. if you went back. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not saying we should go back. You'd have to then write a whole new law and probably have constitutional problems because the internet and cable are not airwaves. You'd have to somehow define those. Exactly. So you can never go back. Yeah. There was a hand in the back. Well, my point was going to be that uh, back when it was three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, the government sort of had a straight line to everybody's brain. So back on your chart, which I think is, I'm glad you got rid of the, the, the false dichotomy of liberal and conservative, but I think you traded it for false trichotomy. <laughs> but uh, of order, freedom, and equality. So uh, the government, anytime they want to uh, you know, beam order, freedom, or equality into your brain, they had a, a ready-made channel. And it was expensive to do that in the old days. That's why you only had the three networks. Um, but there's but also the government didn't control those. Well, yeah, but they no, I mean, through their sources, and uh, you know, and they, if you go to a university, the university's going to oftentimes they're either on government grants or on uh, industry grants, so you're going to get similar opinions. Um, so, but opening this up to any Jimmy Joe Bob with a computer now all opinions possibly equally valid. Now that's dangerous because not everybody's in a position to have good information. Um, so that's about where we are right now. That's <laughs> how I see it. Yeah. Um, Drawing a couple of points it's, from that. It's so 1984. Yeah, and, and the research doesn't support your argument about government control of the broadcast media at the time. It really doesn't. And in fact, if you go back and look at the actual news broadcasts during the Cronkite era and, and before, that was a period where the journalists and the actual news, the organizations that own those broadcast media actually took a loss in terms of their profits to run the news because the, the way the government did affect what they did was it really held them to the public service standards as part of the Federal Communications Act. That they had to, you know, they were given the airwaves for free, they needed to actually provide a public service, and for the, up until the 1980s, the networks did that by actually providing a well-staffed uh, broadcast news program that have bureaus around the world and that took it very seriously in which journalism was, uh, the journal values of journalism were really prioritized compared to what we have right now. And so what has changed between then and now is that you take away that public service requirement, which was the other thing that happened in, in the Reagan years, they no longer enforce that, and that allowed the corporate owners of the media organizations to push the bottom line profit more, which then changed the nature of the news from an, uh, you know, an attempt to present some journalism on how the world is to an entertainment program, which in my view, all television news right now is just entertainment. It has very little substance in it. And going back to the, the Daily Show, John Stewart, there was a study on the 2004 presidential election that actually looked at the substantive content of the network news, broadcast news, and compared it to the substantive content of the Daily Show with John Stewart and found that they were equal. Anyway, do you, you, your hand popped right back. Well, um, I was thinking of uh, Noam Chomsky and some of these other folks who have uh, done, you know, manufacturing consent, and uh, you know, you think of World War One and the birth of the PR industry. Uh, oh, what was Sigmund Freud's nephew's name? Came over here and uh, invented a war for us. So, uh, so I think they've always had the, the government's had their PR PR arm of the government to talk to the media, and you had if you had three big channels, if you could talk to the three big channels, it sort of calls the tune that all the little channels dance to. But um, I think you have a good point that there, it, it, with a robust press and a lot of people out there doing print media who are are fighting against that. 
But I think the, the tidal wave just come over us now. Uh, you, there's no fighting the government propaganda because they say both things. And now with Trump, they say both things out of both sides of their mouth. So there's no nobody s- believes anything. No sorting any of that out. Um, Sorry, I don't mean to dock it. Oh no, that's fine. Um, and Chomsky's uh, arguments really don't stand in terms of the research on the media anymore. Uh, we could talk more about that later. But Chomsky is a linguist not a specialist in the media. He came at his whole study of the media through from an activist perspective. Um, and those academics who studied it more specifically really punch a lot of holes in his, his arguments uh, as far as the media is concerned. But I, I actually used to show manufacturing consent to my media class for, for quite a long time. Now it's kind of in the past and the students are like, yeah, it really doesn't apply anymore right now. But, um, there's there's evidence suggests it didn't apply and he, he made his argument as well. But don't want to keep going down that. That's that's a whole other discussion. Uh, but so another part of this, in terms of the ideology, um, you know, this entertainment value goes over everything else, and it goes to the heart of why we can't really talk to people on the other side of the political divide, right? And that's because you know it's no longer what the situation is no longer what Senator Moynihan used to argue, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own fact. We've totally lost that in our culture now. And everyone feels like they're entitled to their own facts, as well as their own opinions. And with that, you really can't, if you can't agree on what reality is, you're never going to have a decent conversation uh, about politics and how to deal with reality as it is. And so we see that, and we see that on the left and the right. Um, you know, the, the classic one is climate change. But you have a lot of people who believe in conspiracies and conspiracy thinking about vaccinations on the left. Right? Um, and then both those sides, they use the same arguments to deny the science. That is something that we could agree on and then build on as far as political discourse. So part of this ideological polarization and um, those attitudes or those, those emotions, I should say, uh, is that we, we've even lost, we've lost that common ground of agreeing on some sort of basic fact. You guys, or how do we restore that? What? Yeah. How do we restore that? Uh, you want the solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, can, can we get back to that moment? Because we could do how do we deal with this all in one big package. Um, but if there's more I want to talk about explaining the situation, and then be persistent, please. Absolutely, I'm a professor, I'm going to forget it, and I'm not avoiding it, but I think it's an important conversation to have. So I, I, um, I have a question about the sorting, and I don't really know a lot, but I have this idea that there was something that happened with you being rich and about a party at a national level loyalty, where at one point people were intermingling as legislators, and then something happened to that they a separation, and maybe there's some trickle down from that. Is it, can you say yeah, that it's not all. It's not all the media that led us to where we are right now. Um, and uh, there's a book called Off Center. I can't remember the authors right now. Jacob, I think, was one of, one of the authors. Political scientists who looked at what the political parties have done, particularly the success of the Republican Party, and they. In going back to Newt Gingrich and how they shifted their party so far to the right, but also they brought in their affiliate with groups such as Americans for Tax Reform that are so ideologically, uh, um, they want your ideological loyalty, that they made it so that the Republican Party really moved further and further to the right and they enforced that loyalty in a number of different ways. Uh, so much so that. Uh, you know, if a Republican broke their tax pledge, Americans for Tax Reform, uh, Grover Norquist, would, would finance people, a Republican, to run against a Republican who actually compromised with something. So the Republican Party, and the Republican Party built successful party out of that sort of loyalty uh, and set up an agenda, but it's all, but they continue to move to the right so far, so much so that it was, some believe that they would have trouble winning national elections because they've gone so far to the right and they're not a very diverse party. Trump definitely 
messed up that argument a bit. But he's not a typical Republican. But in 2016, was in a typical election. So yeah, that's another source of this of this polarization. Uh, what else? What, are, what other sort of things? Uh, <clears throat> urban and rural. Urban and rural. Uh, I just kind of curious about it. It seems like <clears throat> there's a huge split when you look at how people vote across the country. There's actually been sorting in terms of residential patterns. Is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yeah. So that uh, and you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the problem of redistricting and gerrymandering. Uh, one of the problems that, that is associated with an analysis of, all right, the parties have drawn their legislative districts so that they have, that they're more reliable districts to get more members of their party elected, uh, is that some of the polarization comes from the intentional drawing of those districts but some of it comes from residential patterns that blue state people live with blue state people or red state people live with red state people, um, which then they don't really know anyone from the other side, and so they're, you're unable to have those sort of conversations. So that definitely contributes to it as well. Um, and going back in terms of Congress and polarization in Congress and you know looking over time, uh, again, if you look at the votes, party line votes in Congress, uh, the Congress itself is more polarized than it's been since the Civil War as well, just on voting patterns. Uh, and you see that with the disappearance of uh, you know, modern Republicans from New England and the disappearance of Southern Democrats. And now, fear party polarization there. Back to the media, one other point I wanted to make in terms of the media environment is that, you know, talking about social media, there's, we could talk a little bit about those effects, but if you, and some of you mentioned cable, so you broadcast cable, and then the internet comes along, and we're now pretty much on-demand culture. Uh, we've moved from, and if you compare our choices that we have right now to what we had back in the 1970s when it was broadcast news, you had no choice. It was, uh, you know, ABC and CBS, NBC, or uh, PBS as your options, as far as the media are concerned. And so, if you wanted to watch something around dinner time, you only have one choice, news. Right? So most of the people are exposed to news that way, even those who might not be that interested in, in politics. So then you add in cable, you add in the internet, you add in our handheld devices, all that sort of stuff, and we go from a low choice media environment to an extremely high choice media environment. And so what do you think the public, what, what happens then to the public in terms of their sort of media sorting? Well, I have, it's a question I had back, but it seems like kind of connected here, which is about when you talk about the independents being not informed, were they self-declaring independents, or were they labeled as independents by people who said, oh, they weren't really independent? No, they, they, they self-declared. They said they were an independent, they didn't lean toward the other party. But in terms of the media choice environment, so there's the obvious, all right, uh, liberals will go to liberal media and conservatives conservative media. But the thing that people miss was that a lot of people who don't, are not really interested in politics will stop paying attention to the news up completely. That's, that's a good question, actually. Right, were some of those independents, do you think they were don't cares, or was that in the study? If you don't care, just mark this box, we'll throw your data. Uh, <laughs> Because people who don't care, care the answers they don't know is a very, very small percentage of people who fit into that category. Um, I'm not sure I remember from the chart that you had, which uh, party uh, suspected the other more? Was it the Republicans in terms of national security or something? Or, no, it was just uh, harm to the nation. Yeah. The well-being of the nation. So was the Republicans, be, or was it? 36% of Republicans saw the Democratic Party as a threat to the nation's well-being, compared to 27% of Democrats seeing the Republican Party as a threat to the nation's well-being. That's wrong, I'm going to say. <laughs> what? I, those numbers should be switched. Yeah, no, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Well, where was that? Where was that? 2016. 2016. Oh, okay. 2014. Yeah. No, 2014. Oh, that would be like 72%, 62%, yeah. that kind of switch. Well, yeah. just that today, I, uh, yeah, I would think. Today, the threat has changed. Who yeah. could have who's in power? And that's where Trump brings in something that's really not related to ideology at 
um, the a lot of conservatives disown Trump. Um, he's a threat to democracy, is what uh, scholars are arguing right now, because he's attacking our political institutions. Uh, he's not very familiar with the Constitution and the notion of checks and balances and the role various institutions play. Um, and he's, you know, his he attacks the press and the media. Uh, so much so that it's encouraged violence against the media, uh, and he's encouraged that at his rallies as well. Uh, so the, the, the different dimension that Trump adds that you will actually probably find Republicans, you will find Republicans who are concerned with the impact Trump has on a democracy as well as Democrats. So that kind of totally changes this equation right now. Um, and that's about something entirely different. Mm -hmm. That begs the question that I ask all the time: Is why does Congress, you know, still continue to um, unify behind him to such a large extent? About you mean the Republicans? Things? Yeah. Well, so maybe, uh, you think be pretty pragmatic. They now control the Supreme Court for quite a long time, and if uh, if Ruth Bader Ginsburg doesn't make it, they're going to have a large majority on that court for a long period of time. So they know the effect of, you know, they, they voted party, if you would, ignoring the person, ignoring all his, in, you know, I won't even go there, you know what I'm talking about, um, and his assaults on democracy. Uh, but they are getting what they want out of this guy in terms of ideology. And it's ratting, you know, so they're, from a very purely pragmatic perspective for their ideology, they're quite happy with that. They're sacrificing so yeah. much. <laughs> they, they could be, and the 2020 election will show what, whether that comes into play. Uh, because, you know, Trump also uh, attacks our electoral system uh, and the legitimacy of our electoral system. And so a lot of people are concerned if he loses in 2020. What does he do? Because he set the groundwork, like a lot of uh, other uh, uh, autocratic leaders around the world, set the groundwork to just why, you know, brush away an election result. So I am. I want to go back to that independence and the media thing. And do you know if there's been a growth in the in some thing that don't know, maybe can't know because we have such a proliferation of media, you can't really figure out what's going on, even though we, we don't know what's real and true. So is there a growth of that sector that's saying, well, I'm independent, I don't know, can't know, I'm just not going to get involved? The growth in the, there are a lot of people. The ones that, I guess I'm putting them together with, I don't know, or I'm not sure they answer that right Well, think even more in terms of the level of knowledge of the American public. I think that's what is really at the heart of your question, right? More well, I so wonder, I wonder if there's a connection with like almost oversaturation and they can't like you can't figure out what the truth is anymore. Everything's the truth and reality are getting attacked. Science is getting attacked. Everything's getting attacked. Yeah. Um, not too sure where to go with it in terms of your question. You're asking it. Have we gotten? Uh, are you asking? I'm asking the independents because I'm seeing. I thought I heard you say that independent group is saying. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't. I'm not informed on the issues. Um, we know that they have a low level of information, not because they're saying they're not informed. But the way we do our analysis is we ask a series of different questions and then we use statistical analysis to compare different groups. So if you look at the people that are pure independent, you look at their levels of information on other questions and compare those to the, the partisans, if you would. And that's where we see those differences. So it's not, they're not saying we're not informed. What, but I, I guess what I'm wondering is if there's so much, is the media a problem in making someone not be informed? Is it possible there's a connection between, like, if you have a short attention span, you know, like you're all over the place, you never get any depth of understanding, and then you're not really informed, even though you're getting lots of stuff from it. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. And then, actually, I would use that as an explanation for why that feeds the part of polarization as well. People are so overwhelmed with everything that's out there because of the infinite choice that we have. Um, and because of the partisan media outlets, and because of 
all the different websites that you can go to, uh, YouTube that just peddles, you know, there's a, there was a good piece in the New York Times on how uh, the algorithm on YouTube, you could watch some YouTube videos on some serious subjects and they'll suddenly start taking you into conspiracy theory territory. Uh, so my students are totally, you know, the first conversation I had in my media class with them was they were totally overwhelmed. They didn't know who to believe, what to believe anymore. And so your fallback position is to believe those you agree with, which then feeds that, that, that um, polarization. Um, it also feeds a high level of cynicism uh, in, in terms of the public so that you just kind of start tuning things out and you particularly will tune out the things you don't agree with. In the first place, and so that also feeds that whole pattern. Do you tell them uh, old books with old copyright dates? That's a good place to get information. <laughs> the one book that I have used since I started teaching the class in 1993 is a book by Neil Postman called "Amusing Ourselves to Death," 1985. Uh, a book that was really prescient in it for explaining how we ended up in a culture where we lost our ability to reason and we lost our ability to, un to actually assess what is factual and what is not factual, which also feeds that whole polarization on top of that as well. Because if you break down reason and you break down uh, evidence and you break down the institutions that actually do that kind of work, then you've, you've eliminated that ability to find some agreed upon understanding of our reality and then everybody can just you know, believe what they want to believe, and think the other side is 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 harming our political, uh, harming our nation, if you will. So what happens in 2020, 2020, and you kind of mentioned it, if uh, Trump loses the popular vote, and he says, I don't care, I'm not going. And the Electoral College vote, too. I'm sorry? He has to lose both, the Electoral College vote. Oh, true. Because he lost the popular that's, that's correct. But he claims he did, and that's enough. Right. So what happens? What, what alternatives are there? Is, his true autocracy comes to the fourth. He says, I'm not leaving. And he has enough, that seems to be sick of uh, in Congress who uh, are just going to say, well, just say where you want. Well, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard to predict what that's, would actually happen. It's terrible. It's terrible. I don't put it past him trying, but at this point, I think our institutions are strong enough. And I don't think that I think enough Republicans would say he's gone over the line, and that's too much. Have any confidence in that at all? <laughs> well, I mean, legally, uh, if, legally, if he lost the election and he lost the electoral college, he couldn't stay in there. He could. He, he could. He could say, as he has said with the 2018 election, that it was massive fraud, or as he said in the debates in the 2016 election, yeah, he that he would not right. accept the results of the election uh, if he lost. He said that. <clears throat> And that is so outrageous for a presidential candidate. And this is where this has nothing to do with ideology. This is, has to do with an autocrat or an authoritarian who is not a Democrat in the lowercase d sense of the word. But, I, I, but he's already been, he, he claims massive fraud in California that you know, Hillary Clinton didn't really win by three million votes, that, the, that it was all the illegal immigrants voting. He's, been saying those sort of things, and his base believes him. His base does, but the evidence is. But well, that's a large chunk of the, the public right now. Uh, well, the evidence is not with him, and the, no. his, his base is not necessarily staying with him. I think that's one reason why they voted down in Florida to uh, let a million people uh, get to vote who couldn't before because of their criminal well, records. What the Republican governor is doing in response to that, he's blocking that initiative from actually being Well, he may be blocking it, but a lot of Republicans and conservatives are supporting it because they'll fight for those four votes just like the Democrats will. Uh, everybody's going to fight for those votes. They know that those votes are most likely Democratic votes. And so the Republicans are not big fans of, in fact, they're, they're supporters of trying to make it harder to vote for well, the more harder you make it to vote, the more likely you're going to disenfranchise Democratic voters and Republican voters. That's empirically right. demonstrated. And the conservatives on C-SPAN in their gathering that they had a week or so ago, uh, they claim to be very much for this. Now, they're not Republicans, they're conservatives, but uh, 
Well, that's what they claim. Claims are, you know, it's the action we gotta look at, see what they're Well, there's, is there any way you think that it would boil down to the Army and the way the Army would go? Oh my goodness, are you attacking <laughs> military well, force? <laughs> because I don't think the Army would go with it. Uh, one of the books on the last slide, I have a, a number of books recommended if you want to explore some of these things Thank further. You. And uh, one of the books that I referenced a couple of times here, oops, that's the end of this slideshow. This is a book, How Democracies Die. Uh, by the Levitsky and Zublat. It's, a, it's actually sold quite a bit um, for a political science book. We don't really sell that many books. I've got five. I haven't, haven't made that much money off those. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, they, they actually look at this question by saying, all right, here's the behavior of individuals, would-be authoritarians, would-be autocrats in other nations. And this is what they did. Uh, once they gain power, uh, you know, things such as attacking the other institutions to, direct, to sort of uh, reduce people's support for those other democratic uh, institutions, taking control of the referees like the police forces and the military and the court system. This is, you know, if you were to look at, um, what's his name, uh, from Venezuela and what he did, you could see, how, chart out how he gained power that way. Uh, Anyway, they look at that, and they look at what Trump has done, what he has said, and they show the parallels. Uh, and, you know, he's doing what a lot of these autocrats have done in other nations, and he really respects and reveres a lot of autocrats in other countries. He sure does. <laughs> and it's not surprising, because his, his personality tendencies are towards that kind of authoritarian rule. So I don't... I think the Republican Party would stand up at that point, um, and that would be a bit too far in terms of Trump. Uh, he still has his supporters who are very strong and can believe whatever he has to say. So the, what, the way I would see it if he lost and he attacked the legitimacy of the elections is that we would have a period of pretty bad violence in the, in the country from his sir. supporters. What? A period of what, sir? Bad violence. That's what I asked about the army. Yeah. Um, not the army doing it. No, I know. Uh, but the army would be called in as it has been at times. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you look at the conservative, I mean, actually. But I don't the, think the army would go with it. The conservative faction, I mean, they're, and I'm this category, uh, putting people in categories, but they're the ones that are, that have the um, AK 14s and I mean, I've got I've got nine guns, uh, ranging from a hundred years old or two hundred years. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know the last time I shot one, but but the people that the people that that, that make me think. I mean, my and my father was in the service. I've had that that my my father would go, and, and I think the reason that um, that a lot well now that. You know, some, who I can't remember now and the names now, but some of the uh, generals that he's that Trump had, that I mean, that that uh, and and people that people that don't normally think that highly of military people thought, you know, this 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 brings an adult into the room. into the room, and and, and but if, and I and I and I guess I'm hoping. Praying, I guess that, that there's enough adults in the room that we don't get into this, uh, you know, more of a malicious style style where we start shooting each other. Who's got the most, uh, you know, higher power? I, 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 I think actually your point too that those generals leaving in a way is a good sign in terms of you're asking about the military. That's a sign that the military wouldn't go along with that sort of. Yeah. I would like to get away from this dystopia for a little okay. while. <laughs> and as when did conservatism separate from conservation? Because Lincoln, or Lincoln, Nixon established the EPA as yeah, yeah. just being better. Yeah, um, I read actually something recently on that that looked a little more in depth at the Republican Party and why they promoted that. Uh, and. Because the Republican Party, long being an ally of businesses, 
when the environmental movement came along, Nixon just rode the wave in a way. Uh, it wasn't because he was some idealistic, idealistic uh, conservationist. He rode the wave, some, you know, other Republicans joined them in, but when the, the business supporters got a chance, you know, once they adjusted to that change, because it came up pretty quick and caught a lot of business organizations uh, and interest groups, if you would, off guard. When they had a chance to respond, then they got the Republican Party back in line in terms of trying to limit the regulations on, uh, on industry, if you would. Um, and if you actually look at the growth of, say, political action committees, uh, you see in the 1970s that the, the business political action committees and interest groups really exploded at that time in reaction to those regulations. And then they got the Republicans in line. So that was more of an aberration in terms of, con you know, it wasn't conservatism being conservationist. Although we've had, you know, and the, the libertarians, uh, kind of libertarian vein of Republicans or modern Republicans in New England were, were pro-environment, if you would, or pro-environmental regulation for quite a while, including James Jeffers. Um, and that made them, you know, a little different. But, you know, Jeffers left the party because he wasn't allowed to continue to be the modern Republican he was. Um, and that goes back to, you know, the Republican Party really uh, holding their people more in line uh, and using the tools that they have to punish those who aren't faithful or aren't loyal to them. Uh, and you know, they have, you, you know, do add in redistricting that I mentioned before, and especially in, so in the House of Representatives, then you have members of Congress who come from districts where they're more concerned about a primary challenge within their party than they are with competition from the other party, and that adds to that polarization at an elite level, and then that feeds the polarization at the more public level and the nature of our discourse. Is that happening in the Democratic Party at all? Oh, yeah. I mean, the same kind of, you either toe the line or... Oh, no, they well... Yes, it is. I mean, it, it's hard to believe it's only in one side. They're... Right now, the Democrats are struggling. You've, I'm sure you've seen the news on that. Uh, especially since, you know, if you go back to this chart on ideology, the one thing that's pretty clear is that if the Democrats, I lost my little. Uh, the, the Democrats, if they want to win, they need to be, oh, here it is, sorry. In terms of ideology, if the Democrats want to win, they have to be a center left party. They can't afford to be a pure left party. Uh, whereas the Republicans could actually afford to be more of a conservative party and not as concerned with the center. Especially with the campaign tactics that they develop. Uh, this book off center that I mentioned was really good talking about how they would disguise their policies in order to win over people who were more moderate or working class. So their tax cuts, they would, uh, you know, up low, heavy in the front, they put all the tax cuts that would benefit people across the board, but the ones that really benefited the upper class were kind of hidden and, and came later. Or as in the current tax cut, the, our ta the tax cuts that hit the middle and lower income are going to disappear, while the other ones for the uh, higher income groups are going to continue. And so they did a very good job, not just keeping their people loyal, but disguising their policies in a way um, to really push very right-wing policies. Uh, they didn't mind, you know, they, could, they would attack Democrats on budget deficits, but they, they actually like budget deficits because if they lose power, they handcuff the next administration to make it impossible for them to actually do anything because they've loaded up on the deficit for them. Uh, so they've been very successful in those sort of strategies. Uh, and they've been able to do it. Some people argue they kind of box themselves in a corner uh, before Trump came along. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Trump changed, changes the equation. In the back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just had a question about, like, so I guess I would say it, it depends on how you uh, define some of these things. Like in Europe, in parts of Europe, what they would consider far left is not what we would consider far left here at all. And so I think what people here might consider left would be considered more conservative there. 
And so I think often it's like when you say uh, democracy did not move far left to win, I would personally disagree with that just based on taking politics out of it, like whether you're Democrat or Republican, studies show that some of the what you know you might label far left policies of Medicare for all or raising the minimum wage and the Green New Deal are actually popular among most people. So how do you square that with this idea that we would need to not move farther left when, and a lot of the people that didn't win in the Democratic Party were people who were like center Actually, uh, the, right, and a lot of people lot that won, you know, were more to the left. You know, I can leave. Actually, that's but. not exactly true. That the Democrats wouldn't have won the majority if they didn't win a lot of red districts, House districts with centrist candidates. And so part of the dispute, if you're following, is those centrist candidates saying, look, you know, you needed us as well to win the House. So it wasn't just uh, the, uh, um, what's her name? Uh, AOC. Uh, AOC. 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 Uh, it wasn't just that group, uh, but there was definitely a group of them who came in. Uh, and it was also those who won in those red districts that Trump carried in the past election. And if they hadn't won those districts, they wouldn't have the majority as well. Uh, so they need that sort of mix. The other thing is, going back to ideology, uh, on economic issues, you do not see a liberalization in the U.S. Where you see the liberalization is on social issues, on things like same-sex marriage. All right. But on economic issues, you ask, there, there's some good polls out there that you could look at stories that uh, dissect this notion. You've got to be really careful in asking questions about whether people actually have the information to answer the question. So Medicare for all, once you push past that uh, and actually try to find out what they know about it and what that means, you lose support, you go below a majority in support for something like Medicare for All. When you make it clear that under, if you're talking medi real Medicare for All, that people lose their current insurance. And that everybody is on the same insurance. Uh, you lose a majority support for that. Uh, but I think that's because people are misinformed. Like people don't care about their insurance, they care about whether they can get their doctor or not. Most people don't. Yeah. HMOs are actually popular. Nobody I know likes an HMO. Or, you know what I mean? So I think a lot of that's like the media misinformation and spreading. Once it's presented to them in a way that like every other industrialized nation does it, we're the richest country in the world. Here's how we're going to pay for it, which mathematically has been proven and could easily be, you know? So I'm just saying. But in terms of back to the ideology issue, right. you don't see that you don't see the American public becoming more liberal on economic issues. So we're in the same spot we have been uh, in terms of ideology. Uh, you know, we can talk more and I encourage you to dig into some good journalism, not partisan on either side, analysis of the poll and public opinion on that. Um, and it, you know, I'll let you do your own digging on that. But, but I think but what you were where would somebody find a balanced uh, dig? A dig? Um, the Pew Research Center. Uh, that's a really good source. Uh, it's a found. It's a funded. Uh, it's not. It's a nonprofit organization funded by foundation money. Uh, I've never seen anything that would attack that attack them for any bias. I have an argument with them over how they define generations, but that's a whole new <laughs> different issue tied to some of the work I've done. Um, but uh, so they, you know, five of the, uh, uh, what is his name, Nate Silver and his website, he does a really good analysis of the polls. Uh, the, um, there's a, an ancillary New York Times organization that does the deep dig, dive into data, uh, oh, what is that called? Um, yeah, what? Yeah, Vox. Yeah. Well, Vox, I think, is they do a pretty good analysis of them, too. But in the New York, what is the New York Times section called? Um, they actually, it's a special section to do this sort of deeper analysis of data and collect data on, on information. So you dig into those sites, um, that's where you'll find some good information. So I'm going to go back to um, hate Trump and the idea of dystopia and everything. And I don't have personally the sense that he's a deep thinker. And really, I feel like he's a pawn in a larger system. And rather, a, I don't have the fear about 
takeover because I feel like he's a symptom of other forces and he was yeah, he, didn't, he didn't cause this. He's right. horrible on the side of that. But he took advantage of it. <laughs> well, I don't, but I, don't see, I, don't think, I don't take it to him personally. I don't think he's capable of masterminding political strategy. So I think he was a pawn for other people to do that. I think that, it was an accident. Yeah, yeah. Or, or whatever. But it's a symptom of us and where we are and all these other forces that allow that to happen. So if it's not him, it's going to be some. I think we really have to go look at what are the forces that allow this to happen and are those shifting or are we just going to have another wacko chaos, you know, uh, head towards chaos, basically. Yeah. I, I, you didn't mention, of course, there's a lot of things. We we probably be here for five days and so. But, but, but I see a lot of tribalism, and I don't know if that's uh, all on the on the left left side. And I think that's one of the reasons why and I didn't particularly like her, I, uh, Hillary Clinton, but but I voted for her. And, and 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 then, but then some of the people, which I won't mention any names, that that were candidates for the Democratic nomination, and then when it came down to say, well, I like Hillary Clinton more than I like Donald Trump, and they wouldn't do it because we we we've, we've degenerated to a bunch of tribes. It was a real crisis. Yeah, and, it was, and, yeah, it was, it was and Trump will get elected again if the uh, left and center and the Democratic Party can't work it out and get by on one candidate. Um, that is, you know, that's, it just falls right in there. Easy. Um, can't we stop? <laughs> Well, that's the thing, and, and this goes to the heart of it. You can see the, you know, in our conversation, the intensity about the politics and the understanding of reality that exists even within this room, uh, and it, make, it makes it really difficult to say, all right, well, what do we do? How do we work together? And one of the ways, by the way, in the book, How Democracies Die, that autocrats were stopped was when uh, parties that were, you know, in this case would be the Republican Party, Parties with that had the autocrat come up and decide to no, know we're going to shut that person out, um, or we're going to put this person in check, and so um, you know that that is the way to stop that. And so you, you know, if you really wanted to stop Trump, you need to build a, a good left center and maybe even some Republicans to join in on that. The Republicans have been loyal, and they've been loyal because they've gotten what they wanted. And there's the Democrats who. If all the Democrats voted the way you voted and said, all right, I don't really like Hillary Clinton, but it doesn't matter who the person is, because you know we'll have to we'll be able to appoint Supreme Court justices for a long time that will really keep the court on the little side or flip the court to a little the position on things. And look at all of the things that were done in the Obama administration, the Trump administration is reversing right now that wouldn't be reversed. All the progress for liberals, if you. Um, and so, you know, we, we do focus a lot on personal personalities, and that also is a problem in terms of our political system, as opposed to really, you know, the, the other thing, I, I want to get the heart of, uh, of, you know, there's a pol there are two different dimensions of polarization that are going on in party sorting. And one is polarization based on actual differences in policies or values, going back to the chart I had. That, um, that sorting is happening and liberals and conservatives are different because of different core values. And that kind of polarization and sorting among the parties, if it's based on policy and based on values, is actually a good thing for democracy because it provides the voters with a clear choice. And we have an incredibly clear choice right now, more so since we had over 100 years, all right? That if you prefer Promoting equality, it doesn't matter who the Democratic nominee is. You're going to get greater equality, and this is empirically verified, if the Democrats control the White House. All right. If you want more order and less equality, more market freedom in the marketplace, uh, then you should vote for Republicans, no matter what who they are, in a way. Trump, again, messes all this up in some ways. but. A lot of Republicans, you know, if you look at the percent of Republicans who voted for Trump, it's overnight, it was around 90%. So they knew, you know, they, they were going to swallow having this guy that a lot of them that couldn't stand him and had other problems with, but they knew they were going to get the policies, and they've gotten them. 
and it's been a huge success for, for conservatives, the Trump administration, except for maybe on trade. Except for what? Trade. Or he hasn't got his wall yet. Conservatives are for free trade, yeah. And he hasn't got any satisfaction from uh, many Republicans, conservatives, and Democrats over the issue of the separation of the families and children at the border. Well, I mean, I talk to people who are dead conservative, and they can't stand that. And even his wife didn't like it. But in the big picture, they're getting a lot of what they want. Oh, they're getting a lot of what they want, but if they're... If they're, they're getting 80, 90 percent of what they want. I mean, if you just think about the courts alone, not just the Supreme Court, but the appointments to the appellate courts as well that are now being stacked with conservatives and Republicans, that's going to make a huge difference over time in terms of promoting conservative ideology. And in fact, the value of the that if you go back and look at the Obama years, once the Democrats got rid of the filibuster for uh, appellate court judges, and Obama was able to fill all the vacancies in the appeals courts. It was those appellate court judges that uh, voted, who basically voted in support of same-sex marriage, and they, there were enough appellate court rulings around the country that really, in essence, forced the Supreme Court's hand to accept same-sex marriage as a reality. So those are the things that, you know, he, looking at the big picture, looking at the forest, not getting lost on the... I don't think that's a little picture. And I really don't. I think that is the big picture for a lot of people. It is in the core of the family. And those are Democrats and Republicans. When you take people's children away from their families, put them in concentration camps, send them to New York because they have yes, a robust, to Democrats who have a robust foster care system. Uh, and yes, you can find Republicans who are outraged by that. The question is, when, when it comes election time, how are they going to vote? And you look at the numbers there, and you'll see that, you know, when they're confronted with that decision, they're going to support Trump again. Well, there's a lot of people, Democrats uh, and Republicans and others, who are not going to tolerate the situation at the border. And he hasn't got his wall. And the minute the Dem Democrats cave in on either of these issues, they are going to lose people because the party will be divided. If they don't keep up on these basic moral issues, they will. And you may be right, but I don't think so, because I think there are a lot of conservatives who are questioning this whole thing. From what I see, going down south and talking to people and all, uh, you know. They're questioning it, but the bottom line is what's the no, boy, I, I think they're changing fast. Uh, Georgia may not get another Republican uh, Florida may not get another. But that's problem. due to demographic change. They're putting. In the states. <laughs> no, it's not due to demographic changes. It's Demo due to demographic the, changes. It's, it's due to the determination of the black community not to be put back again. That's part of the demographic change. Well, that's why the Republicans <laughs> are going down to Charlotte for their uh, uh, election. Uh, they're having the Republican National Convention in Charlotte this time. They think they may get North Carolina out of this. I don't think so. I may be wrong. But North Carolina is a very purple state. And um, they went for Obama. So I know they did. I know what they did. OK, a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing, but I'll try anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, where did these terms left and right actually come from? And if you look really, if, now I'll go ahead and answer it. If you look back at it, it's the, uh, the French Estates General. And uh, it depends on what side of the room you sit on, with the kings and nobles or otherwise. And um, since our Constitution specifically outlaws kings and nobles, what are we even talking about? <laughs> are we just like that old married couple where you know somebody burnt the roast three three months ago and she won't let him forget? You know, I mean, are we just poking each other for two hundred years? It's ridiculous. Oh, there's so much to go <laughs> in terms of history. You know, if you look at Federalist Number Ten, Madison's writing about how they've been creating the. Constitution. Are you familiar with the, the, the discussion about factions? Uh, and I thought it was number 10. Uh, that, you know, the most important thing they did was design a constitution in order to control factions in the political system. Uh, and the way you control factions, if, I encourage you to read it sometime. It's a wonderful piece of 
political analysis. Well, then Washington did one party, right? Really what? If I remember right, he did one party, it's Washington? No. Uh, well, actually, on the factions, what they, they knew factions were inevitable. And factions are a people united by a common impulse of passion, united against others, uh, who want to take control of government in order to exercise uh, their vision. So they're aware of that faction is going to happen. And in Federalist number 10, by the way, the Federalist Papers, I'm having quizzical looks. The Federalist Papers, going back to the history of the adoption of the Constitution, we had a consti first Constitution it's called the Articles Confederation. They weren't working out so well. Uh, so um, it was decided that we would have a constitutional convention to amend the Articles Confederation. But instead, they threw the whole Articles Confederation out, wrote a whole new constitution, and then they had to campaign to get it enacted. And the Federalist Papers were the op-ed pieces written by the framers of the Constitution, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, uh, to argue why we should adopt the Constitution. And so they are a great thing to look into to see what the intent of the framers of the Constitution were. And so they deal with that whole notion of faction back then. Political parties did not exist. Uh, the Constitution, in a way, the structure of the Constitution created political parties. I can get to that in a moment. Uh, but the bottom line is, they thought they, they knew factions were going to happen. And the main cause of factions they knew were unequal distribution of property. Uh, and so they said, we need to build a political system that can control those factions and make sure that no one faction can take over and uh, carry out its violence. Uh, that is depriving other faction, other groups in society of their rights and freedoms. And that's how they designed the system. So they're aware of that. Um, and the initial factions were for and against the U.S. Constitution, because there was concern that the new Constitution would be too strong of the national government. Uh, those factions faded away. And initially, uh, what happened was, because of the Electoral College, um, it, became quickly, it quickly became clear to people of like mind in terms of par, par, pol, policy, in terms of what they want government to do, that they needed to organize and build a majority in order to, in, in, to win the Electoral College vote. And so it's actually the Electoral College structure creates an incentive for you to build a majority to try to gain control of the government. Because if everybody puts forward all sorts of different candidates, nobody's going to have a majority. Uh, and the, the party that can pull its people together, uh, or the group, the faction, if you would, back then, are the ones who are going to capture the Electoral College. And so that started, you know, parties started in Congress around the Electoral College and then moved out into the public as a whole. And the ideology was varied. Uh, parties were built more um, patronage uh, in terms of uh, trying to gain control of the government. So what you do is you, uh, you um, basically promise people who will work for the party and get out the vote that they'll have jobs after the election. So it wasn't very ideologically based. And this goes back to the history and cycles. It's really now that it's kind of, it is unique that the parties are really so sorted in terms of ideology. But good question. And you know, that whole. You know, I, uh, you were talking about the reliable sources of news. Have you by any chance heard of a website, Truth is Treason? Or do you have any familiarity with it? How objective? No. You don't know, you're not familiar with it. Yeah. Although it reminds me of Stephen Colbert, who said that reality has that little bias. From the cold moon in his days on the Colbert Report. Uh, so is, it, is that kind of the tenor of that? Is that the, the tenor of that website? Truth is reason. He's very fond of, of uh, quoting sections of the uh, Constitution that he feel are not that he feels are not being um, observed or not being yeah. And uh, he quotes word for word a lot of different sections of the Constitution. Yeah, and then he relates that to uh, policies in the United States today. Interesting. I'm not familiar with it. Um, one, one other thing I want to point out in terms of the discussion about polarization and about ideology in the US is another book and the arguments. 
Yeah. Um, this book, Enchanted America, How Intuition and, and uh, Reason Divide Our Politics by uh, Oliver and Wood, um, is, uh, I would highly recommend this book in trying to understand uh, the nature of our divides. Um, their thesis and their argument and their uh, social scientists, so they back it up with, they, they find ways to measure where people land on an intuition versus reason scale. Uh, they argue that we, you know, we all use both intuition and reason, uh, but there are some people who rely more on intuition, gut feeling, uh, that sort of thing, than on reason and on evidence. So they measure that out, uh, and they actually use this difference between the, this notion of where you fall on the intuition scale, and they actually find that in some ways that intuition is a better predictor of people's views on certain policies, on belief in conspiracy theories, things along those lines, than ideology is. Um, and they also found, and this is most disturbing, is that the there's sorting going on here as well. Are we what, over at 8.30? Yeah. Um, and the sorting is that uh, the, the conservatives and the Republican Party are becoming more and more the party of the intuitionists, which shouldn't surprise you, denying science um, and not really handling reason very well, as our president illustrates quite nicely. I do want to get to, we now got to, well, what do we do about all this? Yeah. Uh, we have two minutes. We have two minutes to solve the problems in the world. Um, in just, uh, no, thank you. Um, I think the solution has to go back to the public. And I really think we have to, as a public, we have to learn how to reason and weigh evidence a lot better than we do right now and sort of set aside our cynicism in favor of skepticism. So a cynic is going to dismiss pretty much any sort of information, anything they disagree with. They're just going to dismiss that outright, uh, whereas a skeptic is more willing to look into claims and evidence and follow the reason. Um, and that book I mentioned before, uh, amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman that helps explain in many ways why we are here right now. His solution, I think, is the only one that really holds, and that is, as a public, we really have to educate ourselves about our biases in terms of our understanding of the world and our explanation of the world. And when we really think we are right about something, uh, we, those are the sort of beliefs we have to challenge the most. And that if we can get to that point, and that's something we have to teach in schools, and that's part of my job. When I teach American politics, which I teach regularly, it's actually, I love teaching intro to American politics. When I first teach. The book I start out with is a book called Unspun, uh, How to Find a Fact in an Age of Disinformation. And the whole book is designed to say, all right, how you, you know, we can't rely on media anymore because all the gatekeepers in the media are gone, uh, and so, and they're not gone, they're still there, but all this information flows around the gatekeepers, lots of misinformation that's out there. Uh, so as a citizen, we have to be uh, able to judge that on our own. And the book provides a great set of recipes, if you would, or a checklist for, that I go over with my students. Of, all right, you got this information on the website. How do you judge the validity of the information? How do you find out, you know, analyze their methodology? A citizen, who can, we're going to have to do that sort of thing because it's not done for us in a way that we could rely on in the past. Um, and so I think that's, that's the core. The author? The author, Jackson and Jameson, Unspun. They're actually the people who created the site uh, factcheck.org, political scientists. Um, but it's a great, it's a, actually a cheap little paperback, great piece. It talks a lot about spin and consumer goods as well as in the political realm. It's, you know, the examples are getting old from the 2004 election, 2004 election, but it's still, you know, how you evaluate websites, how you develop research studies, uh, what, you know, what you look, what you need to look for in those areas. And the big thing, the biggest thing I think is we've lost the sense in our culture, not only on the facts and reason, but our ability to see the big picture. 
to say, I don't want to kill your gun, but big picture, you're going to get, if you're a liberal, if you value equality, uh, you're going to get a lot more out of that, uh, and you're going to shoot yourself in the foot if you don't go to the polls in that case. So, um, are you familiar with The Righteous Mind? I think that was kind of popular. It's in the same yes. vein. It's actually on my desk waiting to be read after I'm done. <laughs> so, it's talking in that same way, and it's sort of where I'm kind of thinking about how we are, which is, he was a... Um, he sort of researched how people come to an ethical understanding of things. He's trying to look at the whole. And, um, and it was kind of fascinating because what you're saying about in intuition, we make moral decisions based on like our whole experience, not out of reason thinking. We do it automatically and then we back into it and we make up excuses. Why did I say it was okay? Why did I feel that? It was okay because of, not because we. And, um, and it feels like if we're not in that realm, like accepting that we're human beings and that we do that. And we're not and, totally rational beings. Right, and pull back from that and go, okay, then let's, let's incorporate that into what we're doing because that is the reality. It seems like we're going to keep, you know, so, but it's the same. Can I make one final point, Jonathan? <laughs> Sorry, it's more promo than anything. My current research, it was this large choice media environment. A lot of people are going to entertainment media and not paying attention to the news at all. And my research has connected, shown the connection between people's exposure to various entertainment media outlets and their political views. And one of the conclusions I'm trying to get people to think about, well, is if, if you get your views about whether torture is effective or not by watching Jack Bauer torture people on 24, well, maybe, you know, think more about how rational we are as human beings. We're not. And that's why, you know, various entertainment media outlets can actually shape our political views in ways we're not really that aware of. And, and the other thing about that was, in terms of ethics that I got out of it, unless that people, nobody's really that ethical, that unless you can have a framework that's holding you accountable, that's what really matters. So that was another sort of dimension of it to think about. If we're falling into chaos, there's nothing you can rely on individually, innate in a human to follow. It's we really answer to the structure around us. Interesting. Looking forward to reading that. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all.